The University of California Master Gardener program extends research-based information about home horticulture and pest management to the public. On behalf of the UC Master Gardeners of Santa Clara County, I'd like to welcome you to part eight of our eight part series, Successful Vegetable Gardening, growing year round in Santa Clara County. My name is Sharon Erickson. I'm a volunteer here with the Master Gardener program and will be your moderator for tonight's session. First, a, a short disclaimer, as we've done in these previous sessions, this course is geared towards residents of Santa Clara County, California, where we have warm, dry summers and cool, but not cold, wet winters that allow us to grow vegetables year round. Actually, this course was, has been done through our adult schools here in the county where it was always in person. So for the first time, we're doing it on Zoom. And if you're from another area and taking part, you may find that some of our material may not directly apply to you. Planting times, local soil and climate conditions, and common local pests may be different in your area. If so, again, I'm gonna tell you, Master Gardener programs are all over the US and Canada that can provide advice appropriate to where you live. On the other hand, much of what we're saying tonight is common for vegetable gardeners everywhere. So we hope everybody who's tuning in gets a lot out of the course. Just to review, this eight-part series began with a session on garden planning, followed by sessions on soil, seeds and seedlings, water and mulch, managing pests, cool season vegetables, and warm season vegetables. Tonight's session is the second of two sessions on warm season vegetables. Karen Schaefer, who kicked off our series eight weeks ago with a presentation on garden planning, is our presenter again tonight. Take it away, Karen. Okay, thank you, Sharon. All right, so tonight we will be talking mainly about the large and beautiful cucurbit family. So, and then we will also talk a bit about corn and sweet potatoes. At the very end of this, we're going to have a question and answer session with all of our instructors from this eight session course. So go ahead and put your questions into the Q&A and we will attempt to ask, answer as many as we can. All right, so cucurbits. That is the cucumbers, squash, zucchini, melons, and more family. Uh, they're all vines, although some have been bred to be more compact. They have these large, uh, distinctly shaped leaves. Some are more deeply cut than others, but, um, but it's a similar shape. They're affected by similar pests and diseases. And so I'll be talking about those throughout the class. Uh, even if I talk about it with one, it may well apply to the others. So just keep that in mind. For the pre-class activity, I suggested that you do a search and compare one or more of these pairs of cucurbits here. Uh, so some of the differences that you may have noticed between them, size. Okay, so as I said, these are mainly vines, but they have bred compact versions of it. So read your seed packet or tag carefully so you get what you're expecting, uh, especially if you're trying to grow something in a small garden area or in a, a container. Days to maturity. So that's approximate, it's not going to be you know, a plant is not going to mature in exactly 72 days. They don't read their tags, you know that. But it gives you a general idea of earlier or later production. So often compact and earlier production go together, but not always. They might be hybrid or heirloom or open pollinated. One is not necessarily better than the other. They're just different. There's great varieties in both. Uh, however, it is important to choose open pollinated if you intend to save seeds from it. Named disease resistance. So hybrids are often developed to address specific problems. 
um, you know, a specific disease, a, a specific pest, something like that. Heirlooms may have been selected for disease resistance, but they won't have been tested for it, not the way that hybrids are. So they're not going to have those little letters after the name telling you that it's uh, resistant to powdery mildew or mosaic virus or whatever it is. This isn't necessarily important if you don't have a problem with those uh, specific diseases, but if you do, then it's important to look for that. Flavor and production. So did you read those descriptions? Seed catalogs make so many extravagant claims. They're a lot of fun to read. Take it with a grain of salt. Many factors affect flavor and production and uh, including personal preference, what it is that you think tastes good. So really grow them yourself and see what you think. All right, it is easy to grow all of these from direct seeding in the garden if it's warm enough, very important, okay? Um, they're large, easy to handle seeds. I mean, think of the, the seeds that you scoop out of a squash when you prepare um, a squash or melon seeds. Great for kids, they're easy to handle, but it is super important that you not rush the season. The soil and the weather need to be warm enough to start the seeds in the ground. Soil temperature needs to be at least 60 degrees where the seed will be in the ground. So not just the very top, but you know, an inch, half an inch to an inch down. And it takes a while in the spring for ground to warm up. And it needs to be warm during the day, not too cool at night. We typically recommend May as the earliest for starting seeds, these seeds outdoors, but it depends on the weather in any particular year. If starting indoors using a plant heat mat helps, remember the presentation Louise did on, on seeds and seedlings and those uh, special mats for plant starting. Uh, in either case, they're very quick. Uh, it's just three to four weeks from uh, seed to transplant. It's important to realize too that seedlings can be stunted if the weather isn't as warm as they like, even if the ground is warm enough. They may not die, but they may not really thrive. Honestly, it would be easier if they would simply die because then you would know that you need to replace them. But instead, they often limp along looking like they might get stronger and never really do. I once planted cucumbers in early May before leaving on vacation. When I got back, they looked terrible. So I planted new ones in June, which is much later than I usually plant. But those turned out to be the strongest, healthiest cucumbers I ever grew. I think in part because it was really warm enough by then so that the plants did grow strongly. So just be aware, you're not always doing yourself a favor by trying to push the season as early as, as, you're, as you possibly can. And if you start things early, be prepared to replace them if they don't really take off. So seed packets for most of this family will direct you to plant in hills of four to five seeds. Do they literally mean you should make a little hill in your garden, a little mound of soil? Well, actually in some areas of the country and you know, some people, they really do do that. Hills will warm up faster in the spring and what did I just say about seeds needing warmth? They will also drain better. So that's a huge advantage if you live somewhere that it rains a lot. If you get these cold spring rains, it'll let your seeds stay warmer and they won't get waterlogged. Is that a problem we have here? Mm, no, we kind of wish we did have a few more spring rains, but no. So uh, hills, we don't really need to plant in hills. What we most often do, whoops, here we go, is simply plant in clusters. Um, so rather than actually on a hill, we simply plant in clusters of seeds spaced apart as far as they say. And, and that's fine, that, that works just as well. We even still call them hills sometimes. You can also plant your seeds in a pot as a cluster like that. And then the next instruction on that packet, and this is really important, is to thin to the strongest two or three seedlings. 
you can't grow all five of those because that is just too much competition for soil and water. So thinning means to snip off the weak ones. Don't pull them because you might damage the roots of the ones that you're trying to keep. So actually snip them off with the scissors. Alternatively, you could simply plant as single seeds or seedlings spaced apart as directed. They'll often include instructions for that as well. So typically your hills here might be three to six feet apart. And six feet sounds like a lot, but a lot of these are really big plants. If you grow them as single seeds, you might uh, space them just one or two feet apart for each single seed. So effectively, you're going to end up with the same number of plants in that, um, in that area, whether you plant as a cluster of three or, or three singly spaced seeds. It, it's all about spreading out and giving each plant enough room. Okay, so now, so that applies to all of these cucurbits, or almost all of these, well, there's a couple of exceptions. Um, so now let's talk about specific vegetables, beginning with cucumbers. So cucumbers, you know how juicy and, and uh, well, honestly, water-filled they are. Cucumbers need ample water to have that juicy, well-formed fruit. They can ramble on the ground, but they will give you straighter and cleaner cukes if, with less insect damage if you train them upward somehow on a trellis or something. And it's also more space efficient. Cucumbers, again, really all of the cucurbits need some help climbing. They don't naturally climb. They, they sort of send out these long tendrils and you have to take them and weave them up a little bit, but it's worth that little bit of effort. Uh, short tomato cages can work well for cucumbers because in general, they don't make very long vines. They might be, you know, uh, four to six, maybe eight feet. They're not, they're not very long vines in general. They can be prickly, both the fruits, uh, as you probably know, you have those little prickles on there, but then also the vines as well and the leaves. If you're uh, sensitive to this at all, I know I am, uh, wear gloves and long sleeves when you're working with the vines and when you're picking those cucumbers. It's important to harvest your cukes as soon as they're big enough for your purposes. The younger and the more slender they are, the smaller the seeds will be. And you really have to watch out for hidden ones. They can be really hard to spot. You see this cucumber in here blending in, looking like it's the stem of the plant. They can be really hard to find. They hide under these big leaves. Um, so old ones, they get fat, they turn yellow, they develop a lot of seeds, the seeds get tough. But more importantly, the vines will stop producing if there's an old one on it. The plant figures that it has done its reproductive duty, it is, it is maturing some seeds and, and then it can just quit. So you have to be sure to find any old ones that are hanging on there. There's been more than once when I've noticed a cucumber doesn't seem to be making any more flowers. What's up with this? And I go digging around and sure enough, I spot a, a cucumber that I missed harvesting. There it is. So drought tip, um, I'm gonna be mentioning occasional drought tips throughout this presentation because uh, we, we are heading into a drought here, maybe not as severe as it's been, but clearly we did not get as much rain as we had hoped we would have. So, uh, so drought tip, plant fewer plants, keep them well picked, give away extras to the neighbors, try to plant what you actually need. It's a common error for a lot of gardeners and I count myself among them to plant more than we actually can use and then feel sort of overwhelmed by it. So make use of, of giveaway boxes to your neighbors, food pantries, uh, next door network. There's a lot of ways to share your excess produce. So cucumbers, 
will sometimes have these odd shapes. And the reason is that it's incomplete pollination. So if you get one like this, this area is never going to get any bigger. In fact, all of these are frankly a little over, over mature anyhow. It's like somebody was hoping that this was going to fill out, but that doesn't happen. It just means that it was incomplete pollination. And cucumbers in the wild are very bitter. Domesticated cucumbers that we grow still have this potential for bitterness. And it may come out when they're stressed by heat or by drought, or sometimes, honestly, for no particular reason at all. Some varieties are simply more prone to being bitter. So the bitter compounds accumulate near the stem, where it connects to the vine, and under the skin. So when you harvest your cucumbers uh, and you're preparing them for eating, slice a bit off here and taste it. If it's bitter, slice a bit further down. You can often still eat one uh, if you just slice it down far enough. And peeling, as I say, helps too. You can't tell by looking, you have to taste and trim. One pest uh, for all of these cucurbits is the spotted cucumber beetle and the striped cucumber beetle. So two different uh, colorations, or uh, two different beetles, but they, they, both, um, they both affect these. They feed on the leaves and stems and flowers of all the cucurbits and, and some other plants as well. So just a reminder, the cucumber beetle may look a little bit like a lady beetle, but they have these very different antennae, these long, um, long antennae like this, whereas the lady beetles have these short ones with little knobs on the end. So these are not just yellow lady beetles. Here's an example of some of the damage that they can do. If it's a bad infestation, just turn things to lace like this. But more importantly, is that they can transmit the squash mosaic virus, which uh, can affect all of these. And as Candace explained last week, the mosaic virus uh, gives leaves these irregular mottled colors and it can affect the textures, sometimes raised things. You need to get rid of infected plants as soon as you notice them, put them in the green waste, not in your compost. Uh, they can't be saved and you want to keep the virus from spreading if at all possible. So two things, you've got those uh, cucumber beetles that can feed on an infected plant and then when they go to an uninfected one, they transfer the virus to the uninfected one. So important to get rid of them. If you can contact our help desk if you uh, want to be sure that it's really a mosaic virus. There, some uh, plants actually have a natural variation in coloration, but you, you can usually tell a mosaic because it's very irregular. All right, summer squash includes green and gold, zucchini, yellow crooknecks, patty pans in various colors. Uh, there's some really beautiful ones that are multicolored. There's a lot out there, a lot of fun with those. Obviously they do best in warm weather, but this is one that's a little more tolerant of being started in, in cold weather, cooler, not cold weather, cooler spring weather. And, uh, and I will admit that I have some ready to go and I'm probably going to be trying to put them out pretty soon. So we'll see what happens. But if you try to push the season, as I say, try to grow some backups in case it doesn't work out. If the first ones work out, then fine. You give away the backups to a friend or a neighbor. And if they don't, well, now you have your backups ready to go. So in general, these are short, shorter vines and they are more bushy than really vining. Uh, still, each plant will get to be two to four feet. So you need to give them a good three to four feet spacing. So you can see here, this is a couple of them in a, uh, in a container. Uh, they need a big container, but they can drape over the edge of the container or drape over the edge of the bed, as long as they're not getting in your way in the path. 
So interestingly, when I talk about the sex lives here of plants, all of the cucurbits have male and female flowers. So this is very different from tomatoes, peppers, beans, and many other things. Those all have male and female parts in the same uh, flower, so they are self-fertile. Here, um, we have separate male and female flowers. So this male flower has this long, skinny stem like this, and the female flower has, you can see, a little baby zucchini. Um, I like to use the, the squash blossoms here as the examples because they are so big. Melons and cucumbers are much smaller, but it's true to, with them as well. If you look at them, you'll see a tiny little melon or a tiny little cucumber behind the female flower. So the first flowers that appear are the male flowers. And we get so many calls from people who are worried because they see lots of flowers blooming, they're opening, they're dying, and they're not getting any squash. Well, that's okay because it's just those male flowers and they're not gonna produce any squash by themselves. Okay, once, once the female flowers start appearing, that's when you'll start getting some, uh, some squash. So squash blossoms are tasty and a delicacy in many cuisines. You can harvest the male blossoms since they are not gonna produce any squash for you. Obviously don't harvest them all. You need a few to be able to produce the, uh, uh, to pollinate the female, but you can produce those. Or if you're getting totally overwhelmed with squash, then hey, eat the female blossoms and voila, you won't have so many mature squash. So if the female blossom doesn't get pollinated, the baby squash will wither and die. So this isn't a disease, it just means that it wasn't pollinated. Might be cool temperatures, might be lack of insects. If you're consistently having a problem with this, you can pollinate them yourself. You use a, a little paint brush or just pick a male blossom and dust the female with it. These are partially pollinated cucumbers, but the same thing applies to, to the squash. So what you can see here is this one got pollinated here. You can see that's where the seeds are forming, but up here, it didn't get pollinated. So it, um, it's not enlarging. So you end up with the skinny thing. Remember those cucumbers we looked at that had the skinny parts. So the same thing for this one, got pollinated here, maybe a few of them here, but mostly not. So it's fine, you can still eat them. They're just never going to become fully shaped. And be sure to harvest them when they are young and tender. The big ones get seedy, the seed can, the skin can get really tough, and they get big fast. You need to check every other day, sometimes even every day. Watch out for the hidden ones underneath leaves um, that can easily become baseball bat size. This bowl, I realize you don't have any scale here, but this bowl is 18 inches across. That's a foot and a half. That's how big this is. These patty pans are, are bigger than my hand. <laughs> so what happened here is I went on vacation and I asked some neighbors to pick my squash while I was gone and they did, they did pick a lot, but they missed a few. Uh, it's okay, these are still edible. Um, maybe some of them, whoops, go back here. Maybe some of them, this one might have been, have gotten just a little too tough, but you know, a lot of these are still edible. Um, some people like to stuff the big ones. And in fact, I've found, I've, I have a few contacts, people that I offer the big ones to, because you can't typically buy the large ones. All the farmers, all the farmers markets, all the grocery stores stock the little ones as, you know, as we should, but sometimes it can be fun to have the big ones. So uh, if you do end up with some baseball bats, ask around, you may find somebody who is happy to take it off your hands. 
Okay. So drought tip, don't grow zucchini for the compost pile. Try to make sure you use whatever you, whatever you uh, grow, use or, or give away. All right, winter squash. So this is called winter squash because they last a long time in storage. So we grow them in the summer and we can eat them in the winter. Uh, but they are heat lovers also, and they definitely need to be grown in the summer. So this is the same family as summer squash, but it's, they're bred for these harder rinds, as you know, and, uh, and the sweeter flesh. So those, uh, those zucchini on the previous page, they were on their way to become, to developing the hard rind like the winter squash have. So there are three main species of winter squash. And I realize that we don't usually talk about scientific names for vegetables, but I do have a reason for doing this. So, so try to stay with me here, okay? Um, cucurbita is the name of the, the genus, and that's where the C stands for here. So, papo, C period papo, is the species. So the, the cucurbita papo species includes acorn squash, delicata, sweet dumpling, and a few more. And also all of those summer squash, the ones we just talked about are all sea papo. But the ones we eat as summer squash don't get as sweet, as I said, as, as these do when they mature. The important thing here to know is that this species as a class, this whole species, don't last as long in storage as the others. So it's important to eat these first, like within um, a couple of months of harvesting them. And they don't get sweeter in storage. And so these are the ones to eat first. Butternut squash is cucurbita moscata. So there's many other moscatas, they have Many of them have similar shapes. They may have longer necks or bigger seed cavities. Some of them grow really huge. I, I've grown one called Tahitian that, that would get like, oh gosh, how long? Over two feet long. It was really impressive and quite heavy. <laughs> uh, so the, the skin is more tender on these than other winter squash. So they're easier to peel. In some ways they're easier to cook with. There's a good reason that the butternut squashes have become so very popular. And then there's cucurbita maxima, C maxima here. And this includes so many, this is just a wild and wonderful variety of colors and shapes and, and textures and with these in particular, their sweetness increases in storage. There are so many of these beautiful ones being sold now as fall decorations. And I often wonder if the people who buy them know that they are edible and delicious and not just for, for decor. So your classic ones, which, so these are some unusual ones, but classic ones that you might know are Turban or Hubbard, um, Kabocha. Spaghetti squash is, is a C maxima. So lots of others. Uh, if you go do a search on winter squash seeds, you'll be just astonished at what's available out there. So some important tips that apply to all of these. You want to harvest them when the rind is fully colored obviously, and has gotten hard, and when the stem is brown. So obviously these stems are all nice and brown the way they should be. You can wait until the vines die back completely. So this is usually sometime between September and November that we'd be harvesting them here. Uh, but you don't want the squash to get any frost damage. So if we, there's any frosty nights being predicted get out there and, and get them and bring them up next to the house where they'll be uh, safe. For best storage, you want to keep them at 55 to 60 degrees. They can suffer cold damage, you know, like that frost damage below 50 degrees. Uh, if you can't remember those, that's on our, our uh, winter squash page on our website, so you can go check it there. 
So any injury to the rind is a potential entry for decay. So handle them, they, you know, so the rinds are tough, but still handle them somewhat gently. And in particular, these handy, handy handles, do not use your stem as a handle, because if that breaks off, and believe me, they can break off, especially if it's a heavy squash, then that's going to expose the squash to some, to an entry point where decay could start, and you'll have to eat it sooner rather than later. Finally, if you have immature squash that are on the vines at the end of the season, you can use those like summer squash. Uh, they will taste, they'll be slightly sweet, so it'll be like cooking with a slightly sweet zucchini, so choose your dish appropriately. But there are, um, there are many cultures which actually prize the green versions of these over the mature versions. So, so don't, just, don't just put those in the waste either. There you go, another, another drought tip. Use everything that is, uh, that is uh, usable. Pumpkins are nothing but winter squash that look a particular way. Pumpkins are winter squash. Um, it, it's just a shape and a color that we happen to call pumpkins. There are actually pumpkins in all three of those species. So the cucurbita papo, uh, the sugar pie pumpkins are cucurbita papo, very tasty. The typical pumpkins for carving are these, these uh, cucurbita maximas, not so tasty. I don't know how many of you listening have ever tried to cook a pumpkin thinking, well, I like pumpkin pie, I'll cook down my pumpkin. Uh, they have been bred to have very thin walls so that they're easy to carve, big seed cavities. Nobody has cared what they tasted like. They tend to be watery and not particularly sweet, um, watery, stringy flesh, just really not very good for eating. Save them for your jack-o'-lanterns. <clears throat> and then finally, Dickinson squash. You can call it a pumpkin if you like, but Dickinson squash, Dickinson pumpkin. These are cucurbita moscata, so same as the butternut squashes. And they are what is grown for canned pumpkin. There are huge fields of Dickinson squash all over the Midwest being grown for canning. It's very tasty. Uh, I've actually grown a Dickinson squash and, and I have to say mine didn't even have these, these kind of ridges, which is part of what makes it look more pumpkin-like. Mine was just a big oblong tan squash, <laughs> but it tasted great. I have to say, we made pie with it. It tasted like classic pumpkin pie. So um, winter squash tend to have very vigorous vines. So again, read your seed packet or plant tag carefully. There are some bush varieties, but even those may need a good three to six feet of space. Vining varieties can reach 10 to 20 feet. Uh, but remember, only the roots need to be in the garden soil. So you don't have to have all of the vines on top of garden soil that you could be using for growing something else. If you have the room, you can let them ramble over a patio, over a lawn, up a trellis, of course, um, up a ladder even. It's really hard to tell, but there is an old step ladder here, painted yellow and orange and pink that this uh, squash is climbing up. <laughs> I even knew, know somebody who used to let her, her winter squash climb her apple tree. So she would have apples and squash coming off of the same tree. You just have to be careful, they are very heavy, but when they grow like that, um, they, they will develop enough strength as the squash grows so that they support themselves. <clears throat> squash bugs. Squash bugs can go after anything in this family, but they particularly do like winter squash. The vines will wilt and die, and it's really, really sad. 
So here you see a pair of mating adults, which is the way you almost always find them. <clears throat> uh, they lay these shiny um, reddish eggs um, on, on the, underneath the leaves, often on the stems like this. And the nymphs are, uh, the nymphs are gray and very, very fast. <clears throat> So what you can do is try to hand pick the adults relentlessly at the start of the season um, to try to keep the population down. Use gloves because they stink. Oh, they really do. Um, look for the bugs under leaves, on, on stems and the fruits. You have to, if you've got a mulch down, you have to sweep away the mulch and try to find it there. Uh, you can crush the eggs or remove them, which I tell you is hard when it's on the um, when it's on the stems like that. <clears throat> they will overwinter in plant debris. So if you had a problem one year, it would be very important to clean up all of the plant debris, clean up the mulch that you had down, compost it or put it in the green waste. Um, and these are very sadly common in community gardens, um, partly because, you know, not everybody follows the same, the same sanitation rules and they can just so easily move from garden to garden to garden in there. Okay. You can grow the squash under row cover at the start of the season to, to keep them out, which works really great, but eventually you do need to, um, <clears throat> to uncover the, the plants so that they can pollinate. Remember, male and female blossoms need the bees pollinating them. And unfortunately, that's the point at which they can move in. Um, however, Cucurbita muscata, see, I said this is going to be important. The muscatas, the butternut types, are much more tolerant of the damage to these. And I have seen those succeed. I used to grow Tahitian squashes in, um, in a community garden. And when all the others would fail, we would get this fabulous, fabulous um, harvest still of the Tahitian squashes. So if you have a problem with them, that's, that's a way to do it. You can also just try to take a break from growing winter squash once in a while. So I had them up here once in my garden at home and I just said, okay, I'm not gonna grow squash for the next three years. Uh, and, and I haven't had them since, fingers crossed. All right, wilting leaves. Squash have these enormous leaves and they, uh, and they will wilt in the afternoon in the heat of the sun. And this is part of their, their water preservation plan. It helps them conserve water and they should be all upright and perky again by the morning. If not, then they truly need water. So that's your drought tip. Wait until the morning to see if the leaves truly, um, if the, the leaves have revived or if they're still wilted before just assuming that you need to add extra water because you can actually overwater them. So um, there is a bacterial wilt that can cause this. And um, this picture is actually of bacterial wilt, looks the same as the physiological wilt. Uh, it's, it's another disease that can be transmitted by cucumber beetles. Luckily, it's not very common in California. So usually if you see your plants wilting, it is either um, because they're doing it themselves or because they need water. What is common is powdery mildew. <laughs> so both summer and winter squash get powdery mildew at the end of the season. Uh, there is virtually no way to keep it from happening. You just take this as a sign that it's time to get rid of those squash plants. You can spray daily with water to keep it away a little longer, but that's not a great choice in a drought, obviously. There are folk remedies you may read about on the web, <clears throat> like uh, spraying with milk and baking soda. They don't work and they can actually be bad for the plant or soil. So don't believe everything you read on the internet. <clears throat> 
younger plants seem to be less susceptible. So um, for summer squash, consider planting a, a, a second batch midsummer, um, plant it as a succession crop. Or this is my preference, just get excited that you now have a space to put in your cool season vegetables because this will happen in you know August and September and that's exactly the time that you'll want to be planting your cool season vegetables. So I accept it as part of the cycle of life for squash. Melons, all right. So melons need lots of sun, lots of warmth to develop their delicious sweet flavors. Black plastic mulch can increase uh, the warmth, the soil warmth, <clears throat> um, and it provides a clean surface for the melons to rest on. Now, probably like a lot of us, I, um, I, I do, like a lot of you probably, like to avoid using a lot of plastic, but um, I do appreciate the, the heat aspect of, of that, uh, that it brings to the garden in this case. So what I do is buy a good heavy duty plastic, a thick mill plastic, so I can reuse it for many years. So it's not just used for one season and throw away. Um, since the spacing is going to be the same year after year, that can work. I also raise the melons up off the garden surface by putting old plates or plant saucers under them. So that helps prevent the pests that can sometimes come from the bottom side where it's against the soil, even against the plastic sometimes. With all of these, it is tricky to tell with most of them when they are fully ripe. You have to look for things like changes in the color, changes in the texture of the rind. So like with these, they, they start to turn more golden. The uh, honeydew types will start to get a little bit sticky. They, they're very smooth at first and then they start to get a little sticky feeling. You've all heard all the different ways to try to tell when, when um, watermelon are ripe. Very tricky, <laughs> very tricky. But there is one. So the cantaloupe muskmelon types will do this thing called slipping when they are when they are fully ripened. So you see how um, there's a little indentation here where it was attached to the vine. These this type of melon will actually release from the vine very easily when it's um, when it's ripe unlike most of these others where you actually have to clip it to get it off of there. So you can grow them up a trellis, again, up a fence, up a trellis, you know, in cages, there's a lot of things you can do. They, they develop nice strong stems so they'll stay on there. This looks like a crane type, which is not a slipping type, so that, that will be fine. If you are growing a, a cantaloupe type up a, up a trellis like this, you'd want to, as it approached ripeness, you'd want to make some sort of sling that you would somehow tie something to the trellis here on both sides to support it underneath so that when it does finally ripen, it doesn't just go down <laughs> to the ground, okay? <clears throat> Chayote is another um, member of the cucurbita family. Uh, it's a little different from the others and uh, it's a perennial vine. So that's a major difference. It is very vigorous. It can grow 10 meters. That is over 30 feet. If left unpruned, you can prune it down and keep it more manageable. And it is commonly grown by sprouting a fruit. So it's so interesting. You, you have a fruit, you can like keep it on your counter and it will send out a sprout from the, the seed inside. So there is an entire video on our website about chayote and um, you can watch that video to get all of the details about how to grow that. It's a little more than I want to get into in this presentation. And there are many more cucurbits. Um, bitter melon there. 
which on you don't actually want it to get to this beautiful orange color. It's it kind of, uh, at least as I understand it, I believe most people use it in the green and it gets very bitter indeed if it gets this orange. Uh, Lufa, there's ang this is a picture of the angled one, but there are the smooth ones as well. Opo Cucuzzi, another Italian one, there's Trombicino. There are many, many more. And uh, I think we will paste a link to um, a couple of links about uh, other cucurbits with information about, about those. Notice that these are almost all growing vertically. Again, it helps with space. It helps keep the fruit off of the ground. It helps them grow long and straight. And uh, it, it's just very helpful. You often have to help them help themselves. Just remember that they're not natural climbers the way beans and peas are. And you may remember this picture from the first presentation, but I, I just really love this. Uh, of a bamboo arbor that somebody created and they're growing the, uh, <clears throat> the fuzzy melons on here, but obviously you can grow anything on this arbor. So uh, maybe you want to construct your own cucurbit arbor. All right, let us talk about corn. So some people love growing their own corn. Fresh picked corn is, it, it is a real taste treat. I have to admit that. But there's a few things you need to know about it. So one, um, probably the most important thing, you only get one or two ears of corn per stock. So you can see that this stock has just a single ear developing here. You need to pay super close attention because overripe corn gets starchy and loses that delicious sweet flavor. And it can go from not ready to overgrown in just a few days. So close attention. The tassels up here are male and the silks out in the, the corn ear are female. So each silk leads to a potential kernel on the cob. They all need to be pollinated. How do they get pollinated? Corn is wind pollinated. So the, the male pollen from these tassels blows around and, and uh, falls on the ears, but not usually on the, the stalk that it's on. They want, you need several stalks of corn to be growing so they can pollinate each other. So what we typically suggest is that you plant in something like this, like a, a four by four grid. So this each dot represents a uh, corn seed. And those are one foot apart. So that's a four foot by four foot square. So that is 16 stalks of corn. That would be 16 if they each had one. 32 if you're really lucky and they had two stocks on every one, but that never happens. They will all be on the same schedule. They will almost all ripen at the same time. So that is great if you're canning or freezing. Not so great if you want to have a couple years of, of uh, corn for dinner now and then over the entire summer. It just doesn't work that way. This isn't like a zucchini where you're gonna be able to pick a zucchini every week throughout the whole summer. Uh, <clears throat> so here's what incomplete pollination looks like. That's what happens if, if those silks don't get pollinated, uh, the one up here. Obviously this is what you want it to be and this is what can happen if you don't have enough. So is corn worth growing? You know, everyone needs to answer that question for themselves. It ripens almost all at once. You need to freeze or give away the excess. So easy to miss the window of ripeness. It takes a fair amount of room. Personally, my, I, what my decision has been is that I would rather buy a couple of years a week at the farmer's market from somebody who has big fields of it 
Uh, it just isn't worth it for me, but I know other people who would never be without their corn plot every year. So a pest you might encounter is the corn earworm. This damages the top two to three inches of the corn right at the, you know, the end where the silks are. You may even have occasionally bought corn that had one of these in it. So the uh, the best uh, way to deal with these is preventive. You don't know if they're going to be around, if the moth that lays the eggs is around. So if you're growing corn and you see those silks appear, then you uh, apply a few drops of mineral oil to the silks three to five days after those silks first appear. Or else if you missed that window, you, um, you just cut off the end which is what you do if you've bought the corn at the farmer's market, cut off that damaged end and eat the rest. Uh, these, these corn earworms will occasionally damage um, tomatoes and peppers also. They sometimes gnaw a, a hole at the, um, the, the top of a pepper and you'll find one inside, which is really annoying, but they're not super common. For, they're not super common for peppers and tomatoes. Uh, they might be more common for, for corn. Again, as I say, I, I decided not to grow corn myself. But a much more common pest, and honestly, I think a far worse one, are raccoons and squirrels uh, to a lesser extent. They know when that corn is ready to harvest. They smell it. I don't know how they tell it. It's ready. They will knock down, damage the stalks, um, and harvest all the corn. It is just heartbreaking. And I don't know how many times people have said to me, I looked at my corn and I decided that tomorrow was going to be the day I harvested it. And they come out and it's like a tornado hit the corn patch. The, the raccoons got in there and harvested it all ahead of them. So that's a real problem. Raccoons are very common in our urban environment. They're almost impossible to keep out, you know, of, of a place. You'd have to have a cage around the entire thing. So uh, we have, I'm, uh, we have some pest notes. We'll link to the pest notes on raccoons and squirrels. Um, but it, it is a real problem. And I will say that this is another reason that I would probably never try to grow corn where I live because I know we've got some resident raccoons that live up in the palm trees or something. And, uh, you know, for the most part, they don't bother my gardens, but I'm sure if I planted an attractive nuisance like corn, they would be in there. <laughs> So sweet potatoes, I'm only going to briefly mention that we can grow sweet potatoes here. Um, they, they will grow fine with a little bit of care. They do require a very long growing season. They're beautiful vines. They make a very attractive container plant. In fact, there's varieties that have been bred specifically as ornamental sweet potatoes, not good to eat, but, um, but very beautiful. But the edible ones make very beautiful vines also. So I'm not going to go into details about these because I did a whole one hour talk on sweet potatoes about a month ago, and that's available on our video channel. So if you're interested in learning about growing your own sweet potatoes, please check that out. Okay, so I will take questions here um, for probably about five minutes of questions if there's one specifically about this talk, and then I will bring my fellow panelists, fellow uh, instructors back and, uh, and we'll have a little panel discussion. Super, Karen, this is Sharon. So yes, we have questions. So pollination. So Anu is asking, what does it mean if my plants has, have lots of male flowers and very few female flowers? Is there anything I can do about that? Um, somebody else asked if male flowers grow before female flowers. Somebody else said they had lots of male flowers. And again, how do you encourage female flowers on both squash and cucumbers? Right. We got questions. 
It's really just a timing issue. The, the, the plants will produce the female flowers eventually. It's just that those first flowers to appear are the male flowers. So just wait, be patient, they will appear. It's true that sometimes if we have really hot weather that can sort of denature the, uh, the, the pollen, it can, you know, it can cause the flowers to dry up. So sometimes if we have a little heat wave that may cause uh, even the female flowers to, to just dry up and fall off without producing fruits. But really just be patient, Take, grow the plants well, give them um, good rich soil and uh, an adequate amount of water and they, they will grow. And then it, when you talked about thinning, if you could say a little bit more about spacing. So this was cucumbers, if you're planting them in a row, do you still need to thin them? Well, so this goes back to, I think it was Candace was talking about how you need to give every plant the right amount of space so that it has enough room for its root system to grow. So if you're, if you're going to grow them, um, spaced apart. So one, you know, like one seedling uh, spaced apart, your seed packet will typically tell you how far apart or your plant tag, if you've bought it in, as, a, as a start, will tell you how far apart you should plant them. So you might have um, a cluster of three seedlings. And then if you had another cluster hill of three seedlings, that might be six feet away from it. If you're going to put them out as single plants, then you might have them one foot or two feet apart. Uh, so in that sense, in that sense, if you're direct seeding, what you often do is put more seeds in than you're actually going to let grow because you don't know if they're all going to germinate. So if all of them, so you put six seeds in in a row, they all germinate, you can't support that much. You have to thin every other one. In that case, you probably could actually dig it up and transplant it somewhere else if you have another place to grow it because it's growing singly. But one way or the other, yes, you would still thin them. So I hope that addressed the question. Yeah. And then maybe we could do one more and then open it up for other questions. So could you talk a little more about avoiding bitter cucumbers? So people are complaining about their cucumbers are bitter. Yes, and, and it, it is a very sad thing when it happens. So basically, you can't control the weather. So if we have a heat spike, sometimes that can stress the plants. If you, you want to make sure that your plants are well watered, that they're growing strongly, that they have good soil. So the, the more resources the plants have, the less likely they're going to get stressed by, by fluctuations. Uh, so make sure that the, they're being watered evenly, that they're not getting dry in between. You know? So you want to be watering them maybe every, every other day or every three days. And if it's going to be hot, you might check the water to make sure that it's, that it's moist enough. You wouldn't want to say water once a week and then ignore it and then you know, come back and oh no, it's dry, water it. So that, that sort of thing will stress the plant. So, so that they're growing strongly, they're growing well like that. But then it is true that sometimes for no reason that, that we can tell, fruits will just be bitter. As I said, there are some varieties that are more prone to it. It's a, it's a, it's a gene, it's still, it's part of their genetic makeup. I have occasionally had a plant that, you know, the very first cucumber on it and every cucumber after it were bitter. And I eventually just pulled that entire plant because clearly uh, that particular plant was going to produce bitter cucumbers and it wasn't a matter of, of culture, it was just that plant. It happens sometimes. 
Well, thank you so much, Karen. This, is, this has been great. Another session on summer vegetables. So what we'd like to do now is open it up for questions for any of you who've been through all eight of the series. Karen's got them up on the screen here. So any follow-up questions you have, I know we've already got a ton of questions, but I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and repeat this. <laughs> so from class one that was garden planning, class two about soils, seeds and seedlings, water and mulch, pest management, cool season vegetables, or warm season vegetables, it's all game. So if I could ask the other master gardeners on the panel who've been busy answering questions in the background to unmute themselves and turn on their videos. And Karen, if you could stop sharing your screen. All oh, right. <laughs> and then I'm going to try to spotlight everybody so that you all can see them um, and we'll see if this works. So um, maybe I could start with, well, let me, maybe I could throw this one out to the whole panel, but maybe we could start with Karen. Christy asked if cucumbers do okay as transplants. She heard they were sensitive to transplanting. But we've had questions about transplanting lots of things. You just mentioned transplanting. You just mentioned transplanting cucumbers. Um, I, any I, comments from you or the rest of the panel here? I am a huge fan of transplants. I, I am much better at taking care of my transplants as young seedlings and I find almost almost everything that they say is difficult to transplant is not, it's, it's perfectly fine for transplanting. Now, sometimes plants, it, it will set them back a little bit. It's a little bit upsetting to them to go through the transplanting process. So if you're good at being able to grow the seeds directly in the garden, it can be a stronger start to them. And I think Candace is a proponent of that. So, uh, yes, I am. So I would add to that. I think I agree with everything that Karen said, but I would add that usually when you hear that something doesn't transplant well, it's because the roots of that plant are particularly delicate or easily broken. So when you're transplanting that kind of seedling that has that reputation, just be particularly careful. That's not a time to rough up the root ball. <laughs> right. You, you know, just make sure you set it nicely in the hole. And, and, and then Karen taught me to transplant beets. And I can't believe how much better beets grow from transplants than from seeds. And it's so, so much it easier is. because those are ones that you have to thin because they're that cluster seed. So you're almost always going to get multiples uh, sprouts from a single seed. So it, 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 I just think it's so much easier <laughs> to transplant them. Louise, you mentioned one time that you have a whole rig that you have. So you start seedlings all the time and transplant. Anything that you have problems with when you do that? Um, I have never had trouble transplanting. I think it's a matter of being careful. And if you have, if you, if you grow the transplant to the point where it's got just enough roots to hold the root ball, but it's not root bound at all, then when you tip it out of the container, it'll all stay nice, like a, like making a sandcastle kind of, only you've got just enough roots to kind of hold that root ball together. And then you just put it gently in the hole, put your dirt around, pat it down. And if you're, if you're very gentle, it should be fine. Any comments, Lisa? I um, I actually find transplants to be somewhat easier in a garden where you put your seeds in. And if you haven't gotten your seed base down, you got all sorts of weeds coming up. I find it's also better or easier sometimes to do transplants and transplant them in the garden because then you know exactly where the seedling is. Um, if you have birds or other things interested, um, it's already got a little bit of a head start. So I guess I'm on the uh, on the transplanting is a great method too. Team transplant. 
Okay, so I'd, I'd like to finish by just putting in a plug for direct seeding though, because there's nothing quite as exciting as just putting those seeds in the ground and then going out and, and having them succeed. It does take more care to take care of those baby, baby plants when they're coming out of the ground. So you, you have to be present in your garden and keep them watered and keep them protected from insects and so forth because a, an emerging radish seedling is one bite for a snail. That's right. That's <laughs> why they get eaten. But I did plant an entire summer garden one time from seed. I even planted the tomatoes from seed and I got tomatoes in October. <laughs> so, you know, there are certain plants you can't do this with, but there are some that it's fun to try. Well, and I, I think Connie out there agrees with you. She says her first time growing fava beans, she put them in the ground in November. So I'm assuming she direct seeded them. And now she's got beans showing and all, she says all she's doing is watering. Is there anything else she needs to do besides watering? No, fava beans, she's grown them exactly the way to grow fava beans. Plant them in November, you get beans in March. <laughs> Yeah. And, and I and fava beans are actually probably the one thing that I would not transplant because you can't grow them in a big enough pot because the seeds are so huge. Yeah. And, and remember that legumes, uh, favas are a legume and favas live in, the, the, there are bacteria that live in conjunction with the roots. We talked about this when we talked about cover crops. So they are getting fed nitrogen by the bacteria that are living on their roots that are fixing it from the air. So they don't need fertilization. They need nothing but water. I do actually start my other beans in six packs, <laughs> which, you know, many people are, are shy. And that's another common one that, that's often said not, you know, don't, don't try to transplant them. But I have friends who live in the UK where they have, you know, different climate and uh, much cooler, rainier springs. And they always start their beans in, in six packs. And they were, they were shocked to hear anybody suggest direct seeding them that, that as if they couldn't be transplanted. So it's, it's an interesting cultural thing here as well. But carrots, only always, always direct seed carrots. Yeah. But I will tell <laughs> you. I, have to have <laughs> I know you have, but. <laughs> so, so I, I I was seeing all of these carrot transplants at the nurseries and I'm thinking, why are they selling this? What's going to happen? So I started a bunch myself and those are such tiny wispy looking seedlings. They look like they're gonna die if you breathe on them. They are tough as nails. I transplanted every one, every one of them lived. I got weird misshapen roots from ah, see? that. <laughs> Right. They themselves are surprisingly tough. So, okay, to go back to beans, I think it was Saski who said that the south side of her garden is against the wall of her house. Is it okay to grow some vines like pole beans on the wall? Who wants to take that question? Well, oh. I. I, I, speak I read that question and I was kind of confused uh, by the description. They have to have something to climb on. So they won't just climb on the wall. There has to be a structure there. Um, but if there's a structure there, sure, south facing wall, they should be happy there. And a friend of ours actually grows them on a, on a south facing garage wall. She puts up string. string. So she ties string from the eaves, twine ties string from the eaves, but you know, you can, you can grow these plants lots of places. Yeah. So let's and, just be clear yeah. um, that by south facing, we're assuming what you mean is that the sun is hitting the coming from the south and hitting this wall, right? Not the opposite, because that would be a north facing wall and it would not get enough sun. So yeah, right. Right, that's the direction of the sun. Back to part one of our series. <laughs> it all relates. <laughs> We've got a few more questions about Asian vegetables. So um, 
we've got a question, you know, what Asian leafy vegetables can you grow and be harvested in our area all year long? You know, it's tricky because a lot of the ones that we know best are cool season vegetables. But there are things that you can grow. I, I know some of my friends tell me they like to grow the sweet potatoes for the leaves. They use them as a summer, uh, summer spinach, essentially. And we, we have uh, some people who have given talks on Asian vegetables and they might address this more there. There are other things that can be grown as, uh, as, as summer greens. And I don't know that they're specifically Asian, but uh, there's a New Zealand spinach, which is, is lovely. There's Malabar spinach, which is a beautiful vine. Uh, so, so you can often, if you do a search for things called uh, summer spinach, you might find some of these. I would add chards to that list. Oh, sorry. I would add chards to that list. There are several chards that will go ahead and take the heat that we have in the summer. Um, and yeah, but and there's many, many varieties. So it depends on the variety. But yeah, you just want to find the ones that are a little bit more warm tolerant. Yeah, and in, in terms and chayote uh, tips are a green also. Um, I I actually answered this question and suggested that they send the question to our help desk because then they could research it, even send it out to one of our master gardener friends who uh, raises a lot of Asian vegetables and and get a really thorough answer. Right. Oh, amaranth. Yeah. Amaranth, oh, that's a beautiful amaranth. one. I know, uh, Jean Lee. That's not particular around. Asian, I don't think. And I just, I just posted in the chat a couple of seed. So there are seed companies that specialize in Asian vegetables. So you can always look through your seed catalog um, and, and look at the temperatures and daylight hours. Another thing that's really fun to do um, that you can do anytime is you can buy you can buy like 25 pounds of peas for a very cheap price. And then you can grow your own sprouts and just seed them in a tray or you could even do it in the ground, I guess, and seed them pretty thickly. Um, you know, water them and let them sprout till they're, you know, about yay big. And then you just whack them all down and eat them and they're delicious. And they, you can do that anytime. And let's see, there was, there was a quick question about sweet potatoes. Amy is asking, what's the smallest container size for sweet potatoes? Uh, you really need something that's, that's like three by three, big three foot by three foot. It, they're, they're big plants. Okay. If you just want them for the leaves, you could grow it in something smaller. But if you actually want to be able to get harvestable roots, it needs to be a good size. You know, to kind of switch, switch topics a little bit, Molly asked a question about colored bark. And I've mm -hmm. seen that question a few times and maybe we could talk about it briefly. So her question was, is colored, colored bark safe as a mulch in the vegetable garden? I'm, I'm not sure who answered that question before. Um, I did. I covered it a little and actually answered it, you know, I'm here in the chat yeah. um, to the end. It's one of those things where, well, it depends on what it's colored with. That said, the ones that I'm aware of from, you know, working in our gardens, the ones that I'm aware of are perfectly okay to use in a vegetable garden. Um, the one thing that you see says you want to steer away from is the ones that are based on like recycled rubber um, mulches. Um, there has been known to be, I think it's some heavy metals that can get in your soil that way. So they recommend you stay away from that type of mulch, but the ones that are wood-based, um, even with the dye, again, to the best of what I've seen, they've all checked out to be okay in a vegetable garden and the package should um, give you some more indication on, on the safety of that. So that would be my, my take. <laughs> Great, thank you. The problem though is more that we don't recommend using a wood mulch in a vegetable garden because it gets mixed into the soil and then it, it takes up nitrogen, nitrogen that you want to be feeding your plants. It, it, it takes a while to decompose. So we usually suggest something a finer mulch. Save that for the paths or around your, your shrubs or trees. 
So Karen, what are you mulching with? What are you going to mulch with this summer on your vegetable beds? I, I will use uh, compost and pine needles because I have a deodar cedar that drops an infinite <laughs> number of pine needles. How about you, Candace? Um, I use, uh, I like to use rice straw. Um, I, I like it because I have drip irrigation and I used to always mulch with compost, but the, as drip irrigation tubes flex and with the heat, they work their way up above the compost and then you either have to recover them or, uh, or live with uh, having to water through your, your mulch. So I uh, almost always use rice straw so that it holds the, it holds the tubes down and it, it makes a, a good, makes your garden look kind of farmish, <laughs> but I grew up on a farm, so I'm okay with that. <laughs> it decomposes beautifully too. <laughs> Yeah, I like straw. Okay, to kind of switch again, how does a new gardener know how much to plant? How much is enough to plant and not to overplant? You don't know. <laughs> you just got to keep gardening. <laughs> talk to, a, friend, talk to a, a gardener friend. Um, it's, it's really hard to know how successful your garden is going to be until, I mean, even the most experienced gardeners will experience failures of one kind or another. So you, you kind of, you kind of sort of need to get some experience under your belt too. Um, I think it's more fun to, to plant just a little more than you think you're going to need so that you do have some produce rather than growing plants and not having enough, even for one meal. Uh, I've had that experience and it's not very fun to just have like, you know, one tiny little you know, not even enough for one salad kind of thing. It's like, what did I, what was the bother, right? So and that's my opinion. So is having extras that you, you then need to do something with it, which means you can give it away to people. Give it away. I mean, there's so many people right now in need of food and there are food banks within reach of everybody. Um, definitely um, don't, don't worry about growing too much. Grow it well, Grow as best well. you can, yeah. Right. Let's see, watering. <laughs> Everybody's got questions about watering. Um, so Marie asked, you know, and it's a question that we get from everybody. What does a regular watering schedule mean? How much, are we talking mm. once a week, twice a week, three times a week? Um, I'm just seeing a question. Oh, no, I, I lost it in the Q&A. But, you know, a question about only the top part of my soil gets wet. What do I need to do? What, how do you suggest people address these watering questions? So what should a new gardener do who isn't sure about their watering schedule? One of you talked about this in one of the sessions, and I can't remember which one it was. <laughs> I, yeah, so I, I, I talked about it. Um, so again, you can always go back to class four and, and review that or whatnot. But the, uh, the long story short, I would love, love, love to be able to go and say, go to your vegetable gardens, water for exactly 15 minutes, exactly X times a week. Um, it, it varies so widely based on, um, you know, we talked um, early in the class about your soil type, clay soils, are great for water retention. So in some gardens, you can get away with watering once a week or what, you know, twice a week, something because the, the soil holds their water. If you've got a more loamy um, or, you know, not as much clay in your soil and it drains faster, you'll probably need to water not as deep, but more frequently because that water is leaving your soil. So the best um, thing to do is you know, to get in your garden and really feel the soil because the, the root zone, which is again, anywhere from you know, two to 12 to sometimes 20 inches deep, you wanna make sure that is moist. And a nice rule of thumb is that if, you're, if you've got, starting from a base where the root zone is moist, keep an eye on the top couple inches. Once the top couple inches dries out, that's when you're gonna to wanna to irrigate again. So for some people that's once a week, for some people it could be every other day, especially in some of the hot days of the summer. Um, 
but it's 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 going to vary a little bit. So I hate to, I, I would love to give you an amount and, and a schedule or whatnot, but it is something you just want to get out there and measure. You can use your finger, you can use a moisture meter just to determine, you know, is the root zone still moist? Is it moist enough? Um, and probably the most important thing though, we talked about mulch and yeah, whether you use straw, whether you use leaves, keep the soil surface mulch because that's going to do an amazing job at keeping the moisture in the root zone um, in addition to keeping it weighs at bay and whatnot. So do any of you others have a, a ideal guidelines or suggestions or examples from our demo gardens? <laughs> Uh, you know, and this, and we all do this, we all go through this ourselves every year, you know, going out there, sticking our fingers in the soil. Oh, I need to up my irrigation. Oh, it's moist enough. I, you know, we all have to go out there and check. We don't just set it for one thing and leave it constantly adjusting. Remember, it's not just your plants. Uh, it's not just your soil that's different in your garden, but the state that your plants are in, how big they are, what you've planted, all that determines how fast they draw the water out of the soil. Mm -hmm. So there really isn't any, as Lisa said, there's no replacement for going out and digging into your soil a little bit and seeing if it's moist all the way down. If it isn't, it's time to water. Plus it's going to depend on how you're watering. You know. Mm -hmm. We, we can't say to water for 15 minutes or an hour or whatever, because uh, we don't know how you're delivering that water. That can make a huge difference. But probably an hour is too much, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> Depends on the system, you know. Yeah. 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 Let's see. Okay, different subject. Um, should you throw, when you have a virus, if a virus shows up in a plant, we're gonna throw the plant in the city compost, in the green bin, or dispose of it, generally not put it in our compost piles, our home compost piles, because they don't get hot enough. What do you do with the dirt? Should you throw away the dirt when you have a virus? I actually answered that question, I think, um, in that uh, the, the, these viruses are spread from plant to plant um, by being carried between the plants generally by insects, but they could be carried by infected plants like tobacco mosaic we talked about. Tobacco mosaic is just a person touching uh, a, a plant that has the virus can get it on their hands and then transfer that to a plant, uh, but they don't go through the soil. So you do not have to throw out the soil. Now, the, the one thing I wish we had Ann Northrup here to answer is whether they're in the root system, whether the virus is in the root system but even so, I don't think the virus can live outside of the tissues of the plant. So it can't get out into the soil, even if it's in the root system. So I, I know you do not have to throw the soil out, I'm going to say. Another excellent question to send to the help desk to get a really definitive answer because they can research, research it more carefully and even uh, contact our plant pathologist, MG, that we have. And, and I'll put that link in the, in the chat as well. Karen, you were gonna say something. And I will, we've gotten a bunch of questions from people who missed other sessions. So again, go to our YouTube site, Santa Clara County Master Gardeners. I'm gonna put the link in the chat as well, but you can go there and pick up any sessions that you missed. Karen, you were gonna say about the plant clinic. Well, oh, actually, I was just going to say that that um, when you read about diseases on, say, the IPM site, it'll often say something like soil-borne disease. So those would be the ones where you would worry about it being in the soil. If it's not a soil-borne disease, then no, your soil is going to be fine. And uh, yes, we, we have a plant clinic once a month on the second Saturday of the month where Ann Northrup answers questions. You can email in your questions in advance and include pictures. And then uh, she will, you will 
essentially come up on the screen and, and you'll chat while everyone listens and she'll help diagnose your uh, plant problems. And it's a lot of fun. It's, it's very educational just to, to come and listen to the kinds of questions that people are asking. You will learn so much about just a wide variety of things. It's, so, uh, I like to joke that it's car talk for uh, gardeners. <laughs> Um, so uh, maybe we can just do a couple more questions and then we better call it quits, but could you comment on watering the vegetable garden in a drought? Um, so what we're going into possibly this summer in our area, how many times should I water tomato plants? Any, any suggestions on getting through a drought? And I know some of you have some firm opinions about this. So do you cut back? on the water for a plant or do you cut back on the plants? Let me put it that way, on the number of plants. Whatever you do, you need to grow your plants well so that the water you do use on them is not being wasted. If you cut back the water so that the plants are barely surviving, they're not going to produce well and that's essentially like wasting the water that you used on them. I, I would add to that, one thing I thought about this year was I uh, decided to grow some varieties that produce sooner, faster, uh, so that instead of having to water a tomato all the way into August or early August to start getting tomatoes, I chose varieties that uh, will produce in a shorter number of days. Mm -hmm. If you read the, the catalogs carefully, you can find that. And that means you're, you're kind of shortening the length of time that you have to support them with additional water. Yeah, and grow, growing leafy things that you can harvest quicker too, mm -hmm. those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would add and kind of underscore what Karen said, when you look at your overall water usage, um, there's a lot of plants in your landscape. There's a lot of plants people water that just, they just don't need water. Um, you know, some of the more drought tolerant, um, you know, my personal love is rosemary. I have rosemary growing on a hill, um, you know, here in Santa Clara County, and it's, uh, it doesn't need any summer water. So there are certain landscape or herb plants that you can really cut off the water. But again, if you're going to grow a vegetable, if you start to not water your tomato enough and it's only going to give you one or two fruit that's a lot of water that's wasted not producing fruit so so i i look into other places in the varieties and then again as candace mentioned some of the quicker to ripen often it's the bush variety of um of a vegetable um they tend to ripen sooner and um, do fine with less water so and then another way of avoiding drought is just to don't grow vegetables in the summer and just do a winter garden because you'll get some rain and you'll need less water. And use the farmer's market in the summer. During our, our long, horrible drought, I can't remember anymore, it's a good sign, uh, whether it was five or seven years, but uh, it was a, a terrible time for, for gardeners. And somewhere we got the impression, I, I'm not going to say it was a fact, but we got a pretty strong impression that if you were very careful with water use at home, you would be using less water to produce the produce you were eating than if you were buying commercial produce uh, because of farmers needing to keep that water flowing you know, much more generously. Um, I'm not gonna say that I know absolutely that that's true, but I took comfort in that idea at the time <laughs> that if I, if I was producing my own food, uh, I was saving water just by doing that. Well, guys, this has been great, but I think this is all the time we have for tonight. So to all of you who've attended, please see the Santa Clara County Master Gardener website. It's mgsantaclara.ucanr.edu for additional information about growing vegetables. Um, we also want you to know that we are hopeful that soon we will be able to open up our demonstration gardens in Santa Clara County. We'll be able to open up in-person classes where we can actually talk face-to-face -face 
Um, so please keep a close eye on our website. There are also links on that website to our help desk, to the online plant clinic, to the handouts related to this and other courses, to links to videos, to all of the sessions of this course and other courses. I want to thank Karen, Candice, Louise, and Lisa for your thoughtful presentations and for answering all of these questions. We have a ton more questions that we're not going to be able to get to tonight. So to all of you who've been attending this series, we hope it's been useful for you. We hope you keep asking questions um, and experimenting in your garden. It's been our great pleasure to present this series. We hope you've enjoyed it as much as we have. Um, there is a survey um, at the end when you leave the session and we hope you'll be able to fill it out. Please know that you can always also click on any of the links in the chat or save the chat and click on the link to the survey. If you don't have time to answer it now, it, it'll open up in your browser and then you could do it later. And with that, I think we want to say thank you, everybody. Take care, stay safe, and happy gardening. Bye. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>